What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Sarah Davidow. Sarah is a psychiatric survivor. She's director of the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community, and she's co-producer of the new documentary film, Beyond the Medical Model. Sarah is a blogger on MadInAmerica.com, and we're going to be speaking today about psychiatric diagnosis and the politics of language. So welcome to Madness Radio, Sarah Davidow. Hi, Will. Thanks for having me. And I want to really encourage people to find out more about the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community. It's one of the most innovative mental health programs in the United States. And can you just give us a little bit of a capsule summary of of what goes on at the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community? We are a community of people largely who identify as having experience with psychiatric diagnoses, extreme states, and or trauma, who are really trying to support one another to find our own paths and healing and moving forward. And I guess the other piece of that is that we also are trying to change the world, as we like to say. And so what that looks like on a day-to-day basis is that we do have four centers in Holyoke, Springfield, Pittsfield, and Greenfield, Massachusetts, where people can go and connect with one another, attend meetings in groups like hearing voices or alternatives to suicide groups. And also then beyond that, we have a peer respite, one of only 14 in the country called AFIA, based in Northampton, Massachusetts. And then beyond that, we also have a number of events and meetings and opportunities for the broader community to come together and learn about different ways of regarding human experience and understanding why people find themselves in extreme states and how we might want to change the way we interact with one another and find healing. And a peer respite, that's an alternative to hospitalization that's actually run by people who have themselves been diagnosed. And how is that going? The peer respite is going great. We are full more often than we are not. We have three bedrooms available to people who are coming in from community. They don't need to be people who have been labeled in any particular way by the system, but they need to be people who identify themselves as really experiencing distress, trying to avoid hospitalization or other interventions, and really just trying to find a place that'll be healing where they can connect with other people in a way that's different than the clinical system usually offers. Congratulations on all the really awesome work that you're doing. And how did you get started in all this? I mean, where does your own story of extreme states and madness and hospitalizations uh, begin? I'm someone who, as a child, experienced trauma. How I would define trauma is something happening or multiple things happening in your world that really create a sense of that world being unsafe. For me, what that looked like was a parent who was coming and going a number of times in my very young childhood and also then emotional and some physical and sexual abuse as a child. And that really shaped how I interacted with the world. And I remember as a child feeling more and more distant from what was happening around me, sort of like I was in a little bubble. That just got worse as I became a teenager and all the other things that happen when you are becoming a teenager and trying to form your identity and figure out how you fit in the world started really making things harder, just harder for me to move through my days. And so When I was a mid-teenager, I think 16 is when I first ended up in a clinician's office. And after all this trauma, I had someone saying to me, so you have a disease. You have something wrong with your brain. You have a chemical imbalance, just like diabetes, that line that so many of us have heard either for ourselves or on TV. And this is something you need medication for and will be with you for the rest of your life. And the funny thing is in the moment, it almost felt vaguely positive, like I had some sort of answer and I believed them. But as time wore on and I got more diagnoses and then I'm in my early 20s and I have at least six diagnoses by that point, I realized that they had no more of the answer than I had managed to figure out at that point in my life, but that what they were doing was making things worse. 
what were some of the things that you were going through that brought you to wanting to get help and ending up getting these diagnoses? I, at that point in my teenage years, was having trouble leaving my room. In fact, there was a point at which in my later teen years, I was living in an apartment. I was in college at that point, and I just stopped being able to leave the living room of this apartment that I was living in. I couldn't even go in the bedroom. You know, sometimes if you've worked in the system, you've heard of people being sectioned or hospitalized because their apartment has gotten so condemnable. And, and I think my apartment was probably worse, but I didn't have people looking in on me. But I could tell it wasn't working. And I got kicked out of college because I couldn't leave to go to classes. And I was self-injuring, cutting, burning, and experimenting with a number of other ways of, of coping that were working in their way, but were not leaving me feeling very good. So you ended up leaving college because of that? Yes. And I mean, not by choice. There was a part of me that really wanted to do it. It was really attached to my identity of, you know, feeling like I was a successful person making my way through college. And I just, you know, again, that feeling of distance that I mentioned earlier in my childhood of, of just getting further and further away from people as if I were kind of floating above my reality at some points was becoming much more frequent. Mm. So the protective measures that you take end up themselves becoming a problem in a sense. Yeah, well, I think that's very true of a lot of people, whether it's around substance abuse or self-harming or you know any food. There's so many different things that many of us do to kind of cope with our pain, and they work until they stop working. But at some point, often they do stop working. And when did you end up in, in the hospital? There was a point after I got kicked out of college that I started going back and forth between Massachusetts and Florida and uh, driving all night. I'm sure I would have earned myself another label had people been paying attention, but I ultimately moved to Florida and that's when I got the diagnosis that really made me realize the system had no idea what they were talking about, which is borderline. I ended up back in a clinician's office and that was also the time that they started hospitalizing me borderline personality disorder. What was it that was so um, upsetting to you about that particular diagnosis? The borderline personality disorder is basically saying all these things boil down to there's something wrong fundamentally with who you are and who you've become. And there's something wrong with your personality. I think that fundamental way, it's really destructive. It's a very dehumanizing diagnosis. It's very sexist too. It's really mostly directed at, at women. Why did you realize that that was not right and it was a negative thing for you? I had just done enough thinking at that point in my life to figure out that these diagnoses were not leading me to a helpful place. You know, so if you think about it, I started when I was 16 getting these diagnoses thinking maybe it would be helpful. And then five, six years later, I'm getting more diagnoses and more treatment, so to speak, and it's not helping I'm doing worse than I was, and it's starting to sound pretty insulting and basically telling me at my core that I'm wrong, that it's all about me, and I just, you know, there was some point at which I thought, you know, there's a lot that's happened in my life and no one's even asking me about what happened to me and why I do these things, why do I cut, why do I burn, what does it mean to me, no one's one's asking those questions, so it just, it became too suspect for me to ignore at that point. And when you got the borderline diagnosis, was that part of when you entered into the hospital? or? Right. So I got the borderline diagnosis because, amongst other things, I was cutting and burning. And that was also why they felt they needed to hospitalize me. And uh, as for so many people, it was labeled as a voluntary hospitalization. But I consider it my first involuntary hospitalization because they essentially said, well, you could voluntarily agree to go to the hospital to get treatment for this, or we can force you if you refuse. And so that was the choice that I was left (laughs) with. So So you ended up in the hospital, even though it was a voluntary thing, it wasn't really a voluntary thing. Right. And it didn't help. And I can say nobody asked me any questions. I, I engaged in all sorts of power struggles to try and get around the rules about phones and visitors and everything else. People looked at my arm to make sure my recent burn mark was not infected. But when I left that first hospitalization, 
you know, I basically had a doctor telling me, well, you need to stop doing this stuff for attention and then you don't have to come back. And that in its way maybe was more promising. He acted like I had some sort of control over my future, whereas others did not seem to think I did. But at the same time, it was another insult, another disinterested person not wanting to understand what was happening for me. So here you are, someone who's, you know, obviously in a great deal of suffering. You're, you're cutting yourself. You're burning yourself. What, what do you think you would have needed really to help you in that moment? What made a difference over time was finding people who, even if what I was doing scared them, they didn't consider me less of a person. As a result, they weren't looking to lock me away. They were willing to sit with me and try to understand, try and ask questions, even if it was really hard. And if they still couldn't understand, still not looking to control me, but, but being with me. What kinds of questions should they have asked, do you think? Just a good, simple, you know, what does this mean to you or why do you do this would have been helpful because I have answers to those questions. And I, and I think even then I had answers to those questions. What are the answers? I mean, is it the protection thing, the coping that you were talking about earlier? I have used self-injury to help myself at various points in my life. When I have felt so out of control of my physical surroundings, when I felt so out of control with my emotional pain, this was something that I could control, this physical pain, and that often felt almost as if it was releasing some of the emotional pain. So the self-injury, in a sense, the pain of it kind of a little bit helped to reground you and get you out of that floaty kind of dissociative feeling. Yes. And the control part that you said before, it sounds like if you're trying to establish greater control then losing control by being forced into the hospital is exactly the opposite of what you need. But the hospital didn't make you feel safer, even though you were physically prevented from burning or cutting yourself. You weren't really physically safer there. I certainly didn't feel that way. I mean, I suppose arguments could be made by people looking from the outside in that perhaps there was some sense of safety, but I didn't feel it. And I, I've heard too many stories at this point of people who don't experience it that way. I heard someone share a story just recently of their own experience of having been hospitalized and quote unquote kept safe for a year and a half in a hospital and then making the most serious suicide attempt that they'd ever made as soon as they were released because of how ultimately unsafe they had felt. I think that's a really important research question. You know, Does the experience of traumatization in hospital actually increase the risk of people hurting themselves or suicide or doing more destructive things to themselves because that's one of the consequences of trauma. Right. And how did you get out of the hospital and then start to move on with your life and, and start to get things back together for yourself? With lots of stumbling points. I mean, I think that, you know, it can't be ignored that I, I come from a lot of privilege in that I have a family who's always had some access to wealth and sometimes that has kept me outside of the view of the mental health system in the way that I think some haven't had the privilege of. So some of my worst moments, I was able to still pay rent and keep people away from me. <laughs> so that certainly helped in my moving forward. Some of it was time. Some of it was ultimately, and though I don't recommend this either, getting pregnant and having a child who gave me a clear reason <laughs> to need to keep moving forward. But there's just all these different stages and things that were happening at various points in my life that were helpful in my moving forward. And, and working was helpful, too. And I kind of hid in the mental health system. I went and started working in the mental health system and really kept my own experiences at home. So you became a staff person at mental health agencies doing work with people? I did, yes. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I look back at those times and in large part I think that I was trying to be aware of my experiences and, and use those in my work and, and do value-driven work with people. But there's also things where, you know, I think I sort of detached from that experience in the name of trying to pass in the general community and did things that I also would go back and do differently. You were really hiding your hospital experience and your diagnosis and your whole, your whole past when you got these jobs and, and did that work as a mental health staff person. I worked in one particular agency, and for the first five years, I, I was at a point in my life where I was not going into the hospital at that point. I was still struggling pretty dramatically, but I was not going into the hospital, so I was able to keep that job consistently. And for the first five years, I did not share with anybody what I had been through. Was there a point at which you decided 
now I'm going to start disclosing. Now I'm going to be more open about who I am. I did. <laughs> I ended up taking a leave. My house had fallen apart. The pipes had burst. A number of things had happened that really just kind of pushed me over an edge. I was teetering on emotionally myself and I really just needed to take some time to regroup. And so I took some time away from work and I decided to quote unquote come out and start sharing my experiences. So myself and another person I was working with created this thing called the Staff Survivors Network that was specifically geared toward people who were both working in the system and had or were currently receiving uh, services in that system. And what was the response to that? I mean, were you able to continue to work in your job and be more open about who you were? Not for long. I mean, I was there for a while after that, but things changed immediately. The moment that my story was out on the web, the funder started apparently talking to my supervisor at the organization and questioning whether or not I was competent to return to the work. So they question your competency just because you disclosed that you had this history, not because of anything having to do with your workplace performance or anything like that. For my prior five years in that position, I had been promoted. I had been told that clinically my work was above many people who had degrees that I did not have and that our program was very successful. So yes, I would have to say that it was pretty directly tied to my having come out as someone who'd been diagnosed. And so they question your competency and what, and what happened next? So what happened is that I went through a process of being discredited, that things that would have not been questioned in the past or that I would have just been able to do without going through an, any number of hoops started to become much more difficult. People were watching, people were questioning on a daily basis. I was getting phone calls or my supervisor was getting phone calls with questions or accusations and it became so much harder to do my work and frankly I, I really burnt out just on the scrutiny of it. And the whole experience culminated in a time when I had been given a new supervisor who was much less sympathetic to the work I was trying to do and trying to understand it. And he informed me that even by putting my story out on a website, even though it was not on work time and not on a work website, that I could potentially be disciplined at work for doing that. And I ended up initiating an investigation in that whole experience. And at the end of that investigation where I was accusing them of discriminatory practices, I ended up losing my job. And Sarah, if we were to step back for a moment, what do you think motivates them to go from, you know, um, praising you as a successful, competent worker who's doing really good work at levels above her degree level, who's responsible for the program being successful? What do you think motivates them to suddenly change that when you disclose your mental health history and now they are essentially trying to drive you out and it triggers you to file a complaint and this whole thing happens, then you end up getting fired. What do you, what do you think is really going on there? Well, I think there's a tremendous amount of fear and judgment that comes from this whole system that we've established around mental health and diagnosis. And I just have experienced in so many different ways when you bring a diagnosis, when you bring these labels into any situation, people begin looking through these lenses and it stops mattering what you say and what you do. People interpret in dramatically different ways and it's based on fear, it's based on liability or perception of liability. I mean, you know, gosh, if I'm in a leadership position and I'm revealing these things and something bad happens, what might fall back on them? It just comes from, I think, really learned bias about what you should expect from people who have these diagnoses or who are, you know, one of the scariest things that I did share when I sh began opening up about this was the self-harm piece. So there's fears of suicide because people link those, although I don't think they should generally be linked. So there's a lot wrapped up in it. So you're describing a kind of an interpersonal bigotry where people put on different lenses just when they discover 
a label about someone. And you're also describing a kind of institutional bigotry that says, well, you know, we may think that you're okay, but we can't risk the liability issues or we can't risk going against the standard of care or what are other professionals going to think. And, you know, we were we were talking earlier before the before the show about really this is a, a civil rights issue. And this is this is the moment where I think it, it becomes very clearly into view that this is systematic discrimination that happens and there are very serious repercussions. What happened with your investigation when you challenged them? Did that get any kind of success? Did you ever get any kind of recognition or justice or were you able to follow up with lawsuits or anything like that? So they assigned someone internally to look into what happened and the woman who had looked into it internally had sort of shared not so much on the record, but just sort of sharing in conversation that it did really look like something was going on that was not okay or needed to be addressed. And after that, I didn't hear from her anymore. I was never given any written results. And I was just told that they felt that there was no conclusion to be drawn from the investigation and that we needed to address the job issue. And that was really it. And I did look into legal actions that I could take, but it's very hard. Employment law is very hard. And I was told even by the lawyers, you know, who looked at the website and and my story, and they weren't sure exactly of it all. (laughs) So I really had to let it go, I think, for my own peace of mind. Honestly, in some ways, it lives with me that I didn't do more with it. But I think it would have really impacted me emotionally had I fought a fight and it been a real losing battle. And now you're in a very different place. You're not unemployed. You're actually the leader of one of the most innovative mental health programs run by people who are very open about their their diagnosis and the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community. How did you go from that sort of low point of getting kicked out of your previous mental health job to where you are now? So after being completely discredited in this other role, I went through this process that has been really powerful of regaining my credibility. And so when I left that position, this opportunity to work with people on a community basis of envisioning this thing called the recovery learning community that we believed would be funded in the coming years was a really important part of my process and it happened right around the right time after I had lost my job. And so I took on a leadership role there of this community that we ended up calling the Guiding Council of Western Massachusetts. And it went from envisioning this process to selecting an organization that we would partner with, which is the Western Mass Training Consortium that we ended up selecting. And then I wrote uh, much of the grant with input from the council and people at the consortium. And then it became funded in 2007. And as I went, as I started there as a co-director and then became the director and got involved with the community and envisioning where it could continue to take us and how it could continue to grow, I just became accepted in a different way in the community. So it wasn't so much about in one job I was the well person or the person pretending to be well and here I just get to be out and quote unquote sick. It, that's not what it was about. It was about being able to be a whole person here with the challenges and the successes and the strengths and the places that I'm not as strong in and just really getting to be a whole person If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. Today, my guest is Sarah Davidow. Sarah is a psychiatric survivor. She's director of the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community, and she's co-producer of the new documentary film, Beyond the Medical Model. Sarah is a blogger on MadinAmerica.com, and we're going to be speaking today about psychiatric diagnosis and the politics of language. And I remember being in, in Western Massachusetts at that time, and it was a really extraordinary process, the, the creation of the Guiding Council for the Western Mass uh, RLC and the, the incredible grassroots quality that all these different people came together. There were meetings and all this input and forums and what do we want to do and how do we want to do this and creating the leadership. It was very, very different than the sort of typical you know, legislators or distant bureaucrats and policymakers coming up with something on paper and then imposing it on a community with the involvement of funding and government and that kind of thing. This was really more 
of a popular engaged process that was participatory and envisioning uh, what the recovery learning communities would become. And so let's fast forward to today. Now the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community is a, is a very thriving, um, and it really is a community. I mean, there's all kinds of different groups that are going on. It's an educational center. There are events. There are lectures. There are uh, films that you guys are showing. There's all kinds of advocacy that happens. Tell us more about what it is that you're doing today and, and how you're making differences in, in people's lives. So it continues to be really a participatory process. Many of the people who are working for us in some of our regular worker roles now are people who came to those roles by entering the community really initially looking for support and then finding different ways to connect and grow into those roles. And so, you know, I think that's a really important part of who we are. And then whether or not you're in a titled role of some sort, the voice is really important. It continues. It it was important at our roots and it continues to be important. So many of the groups and things that we offer come out of what the community talks about looking for. So there's, for instance, the hearing voices movement work that we're doing. We are one of the relatively few organizations in the country right now that are doing that work. And we're offering trainings to other organizations who want to begin doing that work just in hopes to support some of the spread. So the Hearing Voices movement is a non-pejorative way of looking at the experience of hearing voices and seeing visions and other somewhat more unusual experiences that people experience in extreme states. So there's that. There's alternatives to suicide work that we're doing where people who have made suicide attempts or experienced feeling suicidal are leading groups and supporting one another who are, you know, struggling or have struggled in that way. And that's also really unusual in this country. Generally, the fear is that if you have experienced suicidal feelings, well, we better keep you away from other people (laughs) who have experienced that because we don't talk in that way. There's not peer support around this. It's too dangerous. It's generally the fear. Whereas the reality is it's actually the opposite. If we don't talk about it, it's more dangerous. Right. The fear that people experience in saying, you know, I'm having these feelings and and being whisked out of their lives into the hospital is really powerful. And so the, the, the potential that can happen when you just talk about these experiences and talk about the alternatives without someone's finger being on the panic button is really important. And so that's what these spaces are about. And you also have a group for formerly incarcerated people to provide peer support with each other. So we have an after-incarceration support system group. So just like we value the experience of having been in the hospital or getting a psychiatric diagnosis, we also value the experience and the wisdom that comes from having been involved with the legal system or having been incarcerated. And so that's another really powerful group. We're about to start something called the Sylvia Rivera Peer Support Group, which is going to be around gender diversity and gender identity and different sexualities and experiences. So just many different types of opportunities to talk about where have we come from, what has happened to us, what is our experience. And I think that we do it in a very non-labeling way. We do it in a way that is about looking at our strengths and sharing with one another and healing through our connections rather than trying to figure out oh, if you've got this label, well, then here's your box over here. And we're really trying to share that with our broader community. We don't. We think that healing can happen on an individual level, but we don't think that true healing can happen unless the whole community is involved in that and that our attitudes and our perspectives and our understandings change across the board. And this is really innovative work. It's happening um, there in Western Massachusetts. It's also happening in very tiny pockets around the country and around the world, but you're really showing the way, I think, where the system change needs to to be going. Absolutely, but I I think it goes deeper than just having those connections or those shared experiences, too, because I, I, I perhaps have seen more people with the title of peer worker or peer specialist use power still in a negative way than I have seen it be positive. I mean, I think it can be tremendously positive, but it has to be more than the common experience because there's something that happens, I think, perhaps it's around the loss of power that people experience when they're hospitalized, that when they do then 
find some success and find a role and find that that power is being handed to them through the name badge, through the access to keys and staff only areas and all the rest of it, that there's a real risk. And often it actually comes to pass that people take that power and even in the peer role are still having many of the same conversations that the traditional system is having. And so there has to be something that runs deeper. There has to be a shared value system. There has to be a recognition not only of our psychiatric labels and our lived experiences in that way, but of the experience of being oppressed and what that means and our impact and how to really create connections with people on a level playing field and not be a part of replicating the system. Well, let's put this in context because what what's happened is that we had a mental health system that up until the 70s and 80s had pretty successfully resisted um, activist protest pressure. And then, of course, with the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the gay movement, the women's movement, really helped push the psychiatric survivors' activism into the fore. We started to get some change. And one of the demands has always been, look, give us a voice listen to us, let us run programs our own. Judy Chamberlain uh, wrote a book, a um, very famous manifesto for the movement on our own, really saying, look, we can provide support. We're the ones who need to be in leadership. And then this was a very progressive challenge. And so what's happened over the past five, 10 years is that state governments, the federal government have really picked up on this. And they said, okay, we're going to start funding and supporting a recovery perspective and a perspective that says, look, let's hire people, let's call them peers, because the idea is that, well, you share the experience of being in the hospital or having a diagnosis, and this is going to change the system. And there is some truth, I think, to that, but I think what we're talking about here is that in practice, it starts to get really distorted because you get a process of tokenism, you get co-optation, you get sort of traditional professionals hand-picking the people who get hired who have that peer and hospital and diagnosis experience because they share the values of the, of the traditional system. Like you have people who have been on medication or in the hospital or getting those labels who are now promoting force or promoting drugging or, or really carrying the same kinds of attitudes and perspectives that really we're trying to change in the first place, but then it becomes a, a co-optation process. And I think what we're seeing is that this is really happening all over the country. The Western Mass Recovery Learning Community is, is one of the places where it's not happening so much. I think that you guys have really held on to your values, especially because you recognize that it's about values and it's about oppression. It's not just about the token of being a peer, someone who's got the label, got the diagnosis. Now you've got the job and that's all there is All there is to it, that actually it has to have some substance of being really different than the way things have been done before. I think that it's so hard to hold it as a pure approach. And I, I often question, you know, is it... Is it workable to have the one peer or peer specialist in an organization by themselves or even the five? Because there's hundreds of people who've been trained in a traditional model. And it's so hard. If you do hold to the values, your job is very, very hard. Your job gets easier. And frankly, in a lot of places, your job is going to be under less threat if you kind of go with the flow. And that's not really what it's supposed to be about. So it's, I think it can be powerful. It can be positive when done well. I'm not sure where it's, where it's going to go in the traditional system. I often wish that at the very least there was a way to have people in peer roles be supervised, be hired by a separate entity and then perhaps go into the system to advocate for people rather than being under those umbrellas. But it's complicated. And Sarah, I know that your work is there in Western Massachusetts, but it also is involved with the whole peer movement around the country. And you're also a blogger on Mad in America, and you've just completed co-producing this film. And this is something that I've seen traveling around the country as well as there are really good peer programs happening. And some of the places that do have certified peer specialists are doing excellent work. And there is impact. There is positive systems change happening. Tell us about some of the positive sides of this that that you think can come out of it if we can get beyond the limitations of that pure role? So I think that there is absolutely something really valuable that happens when somebody who has been in the system 
received services in the system and generally felt like they are regarded as below the people who are trying to help them, learned that someone who's there to listen and offer support has actually been where they have been, that there's a trust that can develop in a different way, that there are conversations that can happen in a different way when the space is created to really just see each other as two human beings who might be playing different roles at that moment, but who each have the potential to be in a supporter and supported role in ideally kind of a, a fluid way that there's you know space created for each of them. And that's really powerful. So whether that is happening in respite settings where someone is encouraged to not just, oh, you know, you can't be living in wor- your world right now, so come out of your world and come over here and we will protect you. Instead, it is, you know, if you feel like you need to step away from what's happening in your world and you want to come here, then I will sit with you and I will explore with you how you've learned to walk through this world and how it is or isn't working for you and what you want to change because you have the power to do that, not not me. Uh, those kinds of shifts are really, really important and I've seen them be really, really powerful. And you know, it's not just in rest, but it's in any of the number of meetings I've already mentioned or frankly, just in our lives, when we find that person who's willing to listen, who's willing to ask questions with, that come from genuine curiosity and not a checklist or a assessment, uh, those are really important moments for many of us. And they really can make a difference for people. And I've seen people also take that step to becoming a certified peer specialist. And that becomes the beginning of them getting out of the system. And they say, okay, now I can get my bachelor's degree or now maybe I can even get my master's and start working as a helping professional. I have seen that become a career beginning for people, although sometimes it does sort of become a a low wage trap. I think it can be a really helpful way of getting people valued for the experience that they have and the skill that they've developed in their own process of recovery. Yeah. So I, I think that there's a risk just in terms of what you just said. I think there's a risk in seeing the peer work as the mini mental health clinician, I just want to be cautious about that because I don't think necessarily being in a peer role is the first step for some to becoming a therapist. I think it may be the first step in recognizing their sort of personal power to impact other people and the relevance of their experience in their world and giving back to people. I think being a therapist is very different. And I think someone who becomes a peer specialist might in fact want to become a therapist, but I see that as them recognizing, you know know what, this is the career path and it's a separate career path and maybe I can still use my experience there, but it's separate. Um, I think in terms of peer roles, they aren't all low paying. So, you know, you can become a director of something like a recovery learning community. You can become a coordinator. You can become a trainer with the certified peer specialist program. So you can, can become a director of a, a respite. So there is a career path in that as well. I guess I do hope at some point we drop the peer word because just like client, if you've ever worked in the system, just like consumer, just like, oh, any other one word label. Yeah. Patient. I mean, I can user, there's just so many of them. These labels, I think people just need to remember that if someone is in a system where that's what they get referred to, particularly people who don't have a lot of privilege or outside resources and can't just go home at night and hear people refer to them as friend or mother or what have you, those people are at such risk for taking that on as their identity. And, I, you know, there's a woman who said to me a couple of years ago, they talked to me about this recovery thing, but I don't know how they expect me to move forward and do this if they keep referring to me as if I'm some sort of object. We have to be really cautious about the words we use for people and how that can be taken into as an identity as an identity. I'm, I'm okay with peer as a role. And then I go home and I'm mother and I'm wife and I'm friends and I'm all these other things, movie lover, artist, whatever. I'm not okay with peer as an identity. All these one word labels need to go. And I, I hope that we can ultimately just move in a direction of people connecting with people. And yes, there's these job positions over here that might be advocate or or what have you, whatever we think is a good title for it, but that we are people connecting with people and healing as a result. 
So you're raising the broader issue, really, of the politics of language and how the words that we choose and the words that are used by institutions really shape experience and c- can control identities, in a sense. Absolutely. If you think about it, so we have a number of different ways that language is used. We have the labels. We have the labels that go on the people who are receiving these services. And then we have all these words in the middle of how we describe people on either end. And so I think I've already said, as far as the labels that go on people, I I think we have to be really cautious about how that can become someone's identity. I I don't know that it's that healthy that someone moved through their entire life with the identity of consumer, that, that their identity is based on their struggles and even if it's about their struggles of trying to move beyond the struggles I'm not sure that that's the word that is healthy to move forward through that it's also a personal choice but I think then we get to the psychiatric labels and so often that cuts off our genuine curiosity with people and whether you're a clinician or you're in a peer role it's so critical that we approach people to understand what's happening with them and so giving someone a label with schizophrenia or in my instance borderline personality disorder, or any of these labels that are, are frankly these man-made creations that are used as part of a billing system, they don't tell us a lot about that person. And if, as so often happens in the system, we actually do try and figure out who that person is based on some of those labels, that can really cut off something important. So, you know, saying someone is schizophrenic tells you almost nothing. Saying that they hear voices or asking them what the voices are saying or you know any number of different kinds of conversations that can happen from a more genuine place are, are the, the points at which you actually learn about that person. And I think it's really hard for people to be helpful with one another if the genuine curiosity gets cut off. And then there's this also just how we get described if you think about it, if, if you've worked in the system People who are receiving services often get called things like manipulative because they are trying to get their needs met in the way that the system has trained them to get their needs met. Whereas I've seen people in provider roles have entire meetings about, and I've actually sat in on some of these meetings, about how to sort of poke someone enough so that they get upset enough that they can get them into an acute hospitalization in order to get them to a longer term hospitalization. And if you don't consider that manipulative, then I guess I'm misunderstanding the definition of the word, but it doesn't get labeled in that way because they are the providers and not the receivers. So this language is very, very powerful. And I think that as much as people get annoyed by talking about language and feel like sometimes it's an overfocus, that we can't say that we have a particular set of values and are headed in a particular positive direction without examining whether or not our words are actually moving us in that direction. Mm. What are some other examples of the way that the politics of language are played out? If we go back to my own story, I literally sat there somewhat distantly and listened to people talk about, well, she has this diagnosis and she's doing these symptomatic things of cutting and burning and therefore you know, she needs to be in the hospital. It becomes sort of this checklist or flow chart. And, uh, you know, so that's one example. I think that I hear people also struggle all the time with, well, what's the point of changing the words? We're just going to find a new word to replace it with. And I think that's true to a point. We should probably remember that the word borderline itself is kind of like an update of another word, hysteria, that was dropped. And then now borderline personality comes in. And then, you know, that starts to be clearly the same kind of pejorative label. And then what's what's going to be next? I think they're talking about affect dysregulation or something like that. And that'll just become another euphemism for the same thing. Right. So if you've read any of what I've written on Mad in America, the, I think the second thing I wrote was called False Arguments, a three-part story. And I haven't gotten to part two yet. But part one was all about this idea of language and how people are constantly arguing about what's the next word, whether it be around the diagnoses, you know, manic depressive to bipolar and border, hysteria to borderline and so on, or client to consumer to peer and, and all the rest of that, that that's the wrong conversation to be having. And so... From a general standpoint, I think we need to take a step back from those discussions 
And it's not about finding the next word for peer if we don't like peer anymore. It's about stopping that whole process and having a conversation where we realize that those words become the same thing. They, you can choose any word out of a hat and it will become the same thing. It will become the identity. It will become the harmful word. And so we need to stop doing that. We need to stop systematizing our, our words, our language. We need to be creating space for people to talk about their experiences without needing to boil it down into these words. We need to create the time. We've lost so much time in our system where we think that, well, we don't have time to really figure out what's going on with them, really. We need to boil it down into these five words for billing, for our notes, for all these things. And, and that's the wrong argument to be having. We need to get out of that trap, get out of that box of using the one same word for everybody, or we're going to continue to go around in circles. Uh, You know, I talk about myself as someone who is a mother, a movie lover, I love blue cheese, I am a director, I am a wife, I am all these different things. And I think a therapist really got really annoyed with me once when he tried to ask me, who am I? And I said, well, that's a really hard question. And he, he said that was a symptom. He said it was a lack of me knowing myself, a lack of identity, hence the borderline. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> no, that's because we are complex beings and we have to stop boiling ourselves down into a sentence as much as possible. That's a part of the symptom of the disease of the system. And we need to approach language very differently. Sarah, tell us about the new film that you are the co-producer of, Beyond the Medical Model. So the film really connects for me. It's not about language per se, but it is about all these boxes that we put ourselves into. In that along with the language comes the different models and the predominant model, the model that most people have heard of, often to the exclusion of any other model, is the medical model of mental illness. And when I say that, I'm talking about that whole idea of you are someone who has something going on in your head, in your brain, that is the result of a chemical imbalance or, or what have you, but it's sort of unto yourself, not in relationship to other things, and can be labeled by one of the disorders or diseases in this diagnostic statistical manual. I think one of the key points in all of this, whether it's the language or the model's discussion, is that it's not that the medical model and some of its labels are inherently evil. It's that they've been given so much power so as to have become this oppressive force in our system that we see hurting people. And so this film is about not necessarily getting rid of it, but putting it on equal footing with all the other numbers of approaches and ways that people regard themselves. And so if someone is has the opportunity to look at the different ways that people identify themselves and have found healing and choose from one or all of those different ways for themselves, then that's, that's where we want to head, really about getting rid of all the boxes. Sarah, we don't have a lot of time left in the interview. Um, tell us how do people get in touch with you and how do they find out more um, about your work and also about the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community and also find out about how they can see the film. So you can pretty much find out about... <laughs> Me, our film, the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, or any other number of things that I've mentioned by going to westernmassrlc.org. There's a film trailer available there for Beyond the Medical Model. There's information about our peer respites, many of our groups, our calendar, etc. And as far as getting hold of me, everyone who works with the RLC has the same essential address, which is their first name at westernmassrlc.org. And my first name is S-E-R-A, Sarah. Sarah David Al, thank you for joining us on Madness Radio. Thank you, Well, You've been listening to an interview with Sarah David Al. Sarah is a psychiatric survivor. She's the director of the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community and co-producer of the new documentary film, Beyond the Medical Model, as well as being a blogger on madinamerica.com. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in.
You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Listen on the internet at madnessradio.net and on iTunes. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.